Good morning and welcome to Golden Harvest Community Church. It's great to be with you today. It really is very great to be with you today. Thank you for being here today in person. Thank you for those joining us on the live stream and later on on the recorded video, YouTube and Facebook. So, wow, what a huge um, time it's been. God has been just so faithful, um, so gracious and merciful because that's the way he is. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to share the word of life with you again today. Um, I believe that what God's placed in my heart is very significant for each and every one of us. And I think it's quite honestly, um, there are certain topics where you, you can't have too much of. And this is one of those topics I don't believe we get enough of. And I also believe it's one of those topics where you can't have too much of. And that's, we started talking a fortnight ago if you caught the message from, from a fortnight ago with me live streaming from my little desk in, in uh, Mudgee, uh, I spoke about the goodness of God. All right, and the, and the scripture, if you, wanna, if you ever want to just do a quick check, it doesn't take m but, but a couple of minutes on, uh, with all the wonderful internet tools we've got these days, and you search for, for the Lord is good, or just the Lord is good, even if you just took that phrase, you know how many dozens and I'm saying dozens, dozens of times that phrase occurs, Old Testament, you know, when God's supposed to be this, you know, thunder and doom and God. When God wants to speak about himself, when the Holy Spirit inspires writers, right, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is, all scripture is God breathed. It says that the men of old, Peter says that the men of old were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They wrote as they were born, carried along, like a, you know, bearing a load, or a person being born on the back of a horse, like not born as in B-O-R-N, B-O-R-N-E, I think it is, right? Carried, as they were born by the Holy Spirit. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They wrote, they wrote, it, all scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scripture is God breathed. And so the importance of anointed preaching and teaching is that the letter becomes life. It's, it was Jesus' idea to give the fivefold ministry. It wasn't my idea, and I surely didn't appoint myself. <laughs> yeah, I can promise you that. For me to stand in front of a camera and point a camera at my face, you've got to be kidding. You know the last time I took a selfie? No, neither do I, because I don't. I never have. I'm serious. You know, so some of these work sites, um, you've got to have a, an induction card and your face has to be on it. For that, I've done that. And the last time I did that was maybe four years ago. All right. So that's me and cameras. But it's because of my love for you. More, no, more importantly, my love for him. Well, let's, let's, let's step one step back. John says, we love because. And what's the because? He started it. The Lord started the whole love thing. The whole love thing started with God is love. Galatians, is it, right? God is love. And he who abides in God abides in love because God is love. And it's only religious philosophies that have darkened that picture. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Paul, talking to the Corinthian church, says, what fellowship, what communion is there possibly between any form of light and darkness? Come into this building in the middle of the night and turn on any form of light, even activating your phone. Where does the darkness go? It immediately starts to get pushed away. You can't put them in a blender and mix a little bit of light with a little... They're not paints. Which is the stronger? Which one moves when the other one turns up? Darkness exits when light enters. Darkness only ever exists because light is removed, absent or blocked. The entrance of his word brings light. Psalm 119 something, 103 I think. Psalm 119 something says the entrance of his word brings light. Okay, it was the Lord Jesus Christ who appointed some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What for? That sentence doesn't stop there. 
for the perfecting of the saints, and it still doesn't stop there, for the work of service. Okay? Anointing is the person of the Holy Spirit. All scripture is God breathed, pneuma, breath, spirit. The Holy Spirit gave breath to the writings which we call scripture. They are inspired by him. And the scripture says the letter kills, but the spirit gives, come on, finish it for me, life. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will result in what? Liberty, freedom. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus is also the one who said, hey, by the way, wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, liberty. So we've got love, light, and liberty. Is there any one of those you'd like to be without? Is there any one of those where you go, oh, no, I'm okay, I'm, I'm not good, I'm good, I'm all topped up on that. No, of course we want more light, more love, and more liberty. What are they trying to take away from us? Liberties. The light, they definitely want to block the light out. Silence the voice of truth. Right? And what the spirit of this world and the spirit of this age wants to do is cause us to feel isolated, rejected, cut off from the love of God, cut off from the life of God, not good enough, not pure enough, not holy enough, not righteous enough for a loving God. And so therefore creates a distance, creates a separation, that creates a separation anxiety. Because why? We were born for relationship with Father God. 1 John 1, 3. This is all bonus material, by the way. It's not even an intro. It's just, it's just, just leapt off the cliff. Praise God. 1 John 1, 3 says, we want, uh, our fellowship is with, the, the second half of it says, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And what he's saying is, we want you to come into and enjoy the same fellowship that we enjoy. And by the way, that fellowship is Father and Son. Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Christ Jesus. So the more I go down this track of, of walking with my Father, getting to know my Father better, the more I understand some very important things. And it's sometimes it's a shame that you have to cross age 50 to find some things out and sort of start to figure some things out. Yes, I'm showing my age. What are the most important things in life, everybody in the room and, in, and those watching you have a few little grey hairs here and there? We won't count them. We're not going to highlight them either. And if you colour them, that's good. God bless you. <laughs> what are the most precious things in life? Why do we have to wait till we become of the age of grandparents to realize that people and relationships are the most important things in life. And when we're young and not, not as well informed, I was gonna say young and stupid. So when we're young and not as well informed, we go for stuff, we accumulate stuff. And after a while, especially anybody who's had serious health challenges, they realize, look, I met Pete, I was working I'm so far off track right now, but on track. <laughs> but just out here, like it's a, it's a little, you know, hey, the scenic route where you pa the scenic route where you leave the main highway and you pass through the town, but you end up back on track. That's what I'm doing right now. So we're doing a scenic route. So I worked uh, in the finance industry for a while there. And, I, and so I would visit with people in their homes and I'd meet people face to face over coffee tables and, and dining tables, very pretty much. It was a very interesting situation and I learnt so much in that job. Now it's back, started about 2001 through to 2007-ish there somewhere. So I'm meeting people, a lot of them retirement age, some with just a few hard earned dollars and some who, you know, accumulated a bit more wealth. They were effectively millionaires. And I met several people who had cancer and we're going to die prematurely. And no amount of the money they had was going to change that. No amount of that money was going to change it. 
if they got really the best health care and if they had more money than the person next door, then they might be able to stretch their life out a little bit with no guarantee. I can tell you from those interactions that any one of those wives would have given up house, home, and everything they had to keep that man alive. They'd have moved into a tent because people and relationships are the highest priority. Jesus said, Jesus said, the Pharisees are up in his grill. They're having a go. Your blokes picked corn on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. God didn't make people to keep a set of rules. He made a set of rules to protect people. <laughs> to protect sanity to preserve us from burning ourselves out and to restrain the madness that would otherwise be rife if there was no law and no infor law enforcement. Take away the police and what do you have? Anarchy. If the police go on strike, it goes nuts. It happened once in Australia, in Melbourne, about 1929, I think it was, I researched it. And, you know, jewellery shops were broken into, windows were smashed, people, there was rioting and stuff like that when Melbourne police here in Australia went on strike. In Brazil, it resulted in deaths, over 100 car, uh, 100 car thefts, I forget how many murders, for one day the police went on strike. The laws of God aren't there to restrict us, to tie us up in knots and to give him an excuse to hit us over the head with something. They're there to restrain madness. The madness of a fallen sinful world, a fallen sinful nature that entered into man when, God, when, when originally we were made in the image of God, in his likeness, to be able to look at him and he could see his resemblance in us and smile that warm, loving smile as he looked at his resemblance in us. And though that was broken and messed up, it's still the original intention. He didn't change. I am the Lord. I change. So what is God looking to do with us and through us and for us? Restore the image of his son in us so that we can stand before him clean and forgiven and with like not a, no record. Like that stuff just so eliminated that it's not even in the picture anymore. That's what right stand, that's what righteousness means. It's not, it, it, it has a legal aspect of it because Satan is the accuser. Jesus is our defense lawyer. He's the high priest that ever lives to intercede for us. Hebrews somewhere. Four, I suppose. So the blood of Jesus Christ, the death, the cross, it's all legal transaction, absolutely. But the whole basis and primary drive behind every aspect of all of that is for God so loved the world that he sent Christ Jesus to accomplish for us what we could not possibly accomplish for ourselves. And that's what it means to have your father be God. Like the big G followed by the big O followed by the big D. The God, not a little G God. But God wants to be God. You see, see what I've started to discover is that <laughs> a grandparent wants to be a grandparent. They want to dote over the kids. Like, they enjoy it, you know? They're almost kind of saying, so when's the next one coming along? You know, like that kind of stuff. Because they've come into a phase where they're starting to enjoy something completely new. They've been, maybe even been looking forward to it. And now, and now they get to be the grandparent and the, the little one looking up to them and just thinking that they are God, you know? Like, that they're the third, fourth part of the Trinity, you know? And that's really cute and it's really cool, right? So can't you see, can't you imagine, can't you, can't you kind of grasp, if we can look at that just so, so simply and humanly, that God is longing to be dad. He's longing to be God for us, God to us. He's longing to do with us and do for us what we can't possibly do for ourselves. Isn't it a treat to take a little child, a grandchild, 
especially, but they'd take a little child and introduce them to something special, wonderful and unique that they couldn't access on their own. But you provide entry. One of the things I love about music lessons and this sort of thing is I'm getting to locate something that God's deposited in this little child, this young life. And I get to identify it and because I know, you see, I'm, I'm covert, I'm sneaky. Because I'm actually, I'm, I'm there as a music teacher, but guess what? I'm a missionary. And what I'm doing is I'm looking at that kid through the eyes of destiny. I'm looking at this young child going, that gift came from God. And there's a, God's got a plan for that kid. And, go, and so I'm looking for, I, I can see that flame. And my, my joy is to go, and to throw a little bit of fuel on it and to, and to help fan into flame a gift that I didn't create and couldn't. But my maker did. My father did. The Lord God Almighty did. He breathed it into that young life. As you'll see when we eventually get to the message. What a privilege. So why do we get so hung up on what we can't do <laughs> and what, our, what we see our limits are and our limitations are irrelevant. All things are possible to the one who believes. <laughs> Why? Because we're connected to the maker, the creator of heaven and earth. By relationship. Not by manipulation. Not by if I get this scripture and I twist God's arm. All right, all right. Anyway, I guess it's about time to pray and start, is it? <laughs> so make it official let's pray without getting religious about it because we don't have to let's just say thanks like everywhere like right now just say thanks thank you lord your way those watching those listening online say thank you say hello i love you lord wonderful savior express some worship to him right now just take a moment to do that just say hello say thank you great and mighty king from your heart from your heart just open your heart to him. Open your heart. We don't need an hour's praise and worship. We can open our hearts right here, right now, and just say, God, you're beautiful. You're my dad. You're my father. You're so beautiful. You're so awesome. Lord, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. What a privilege to be called your child. Wonderful father. Wonderful king. Holy majesty. Beautiful saviour. Speak to your people today, Father. Speak to your people. Speak to your people. I know you're passionate about this message and I'm, I'm, I'm passionate with you, Lord. And I want to I wanna present it in your heart. Help me to do that, Father, and help people to capture that passion today. In Jesus' name I pray. All right. Beautiful. Genesis 2, 16, 17. Let's start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, so where are we? Genesis 2, right at the very early days of our history. It's not a Sunday school story. It's your history and my history. The history of the planet. Origins, right? That's what Genesis means. It means origins. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely do what? Die. Die. We know they ate, right? Did they both drop dead on the spot? Is this true or false? <laughs> uh, I know, like you don't have to answer out loud. I get it. Have you ever had that question go through your mind? So how is it that Adam was then to live on for another 800 and I don't know how many years, I can't remember now, but hundreds, like centuries, past this point? Well, clearly, if it meant drop dead on the spot physically, it would have happened because God can't lie, won't lie, can't lie. And if he was to lie, he'd stop being God and we wouldn't even know about any of this, right? It'd be all done, done and dusted. So let's have a look at this because I'm glad you asked. Let's have a look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 18. What, what, kind of, what kind of death or die are we actually talking about here? So, 
here, when it, here we are now, we're jumped into the New Testament. Hold now, stay right in there with me, right? Stay in close right now, because this is very important. We're laying a foundation. Ephesians 4, 17, 18. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, the nations, those who don't know God, in the futility of their minds. Isn't it? Isn't it a painful when you're stuck in a situation where all you've got to rely on is what you know and what you know is not enough and not even close to enough? Okay. That's not God's intention. For us to walk in the futility of our minds and just be limited to our life's experience, our education, our culture, our environment, you know, so sociology and the world system says, oh, you're just a product of your environment. We are all just a product of our environment. No, our environment has certainly deeply influenced us. It's deeply shaped our thinking. And if we, start, if we walk and live and act out of that thinking, then yes, the product, the fruit, the results of our choices, our decisions, our actions, our attitudes and our behaviours are shaping our current world. What if we changed our thinking? What if we started to think better, think differently, think expansively, think progressively, think visionary? What if we, what if we started to introduce a new type of thinking so that our minds were no longer futile Huh? Going nowhere. And we started to renew our mind. Sounds like Romans chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, doesn't it? What if we were to be transformed and have our whole lives transformed by renewing this mind so that it's no longer futile, but pro productive, fruitful, pro progressive? Not using progressive like you know, the liberal leftist progressive, which is kill babies. That's progressive, that's progress. We kill babies and you want to call that progress. Boy, oh boy. So no longer just limited to what we know or think we know. Isn't it amazing we can know so much until it's put to the test? Until you actually have to front up and deliver. There's, you know, come on, we've all met those textbook experts. The, one, the person who's gone right through high school gone right through university. From high school, they went to university. From university, they went on to do their masters. From their masters, they wanted to do their doctorate. They've never got their hands dirty. <laughs> never. They've been decades in education. Now they're doctor, so-and-so. And they want to tell you how to live your life. That's just by the by. <laughs> what about a renewed mind? What a wonderful transformation. See, the, we, th we always think of... Sometimes we want the spiritual to be spectacular. Sometimes we think unless it's miraculous, it's not spiritual. But what if the truth would come into your heart and mind? And the truth would set you free from something that was a bondage and a limitation. And then when you woke up to morning, tomorrow morning, you could start to make decisions that started to reshape your life and your world was transformed and that affected your spouse and your kids and your grandkids and the, your workmates. And suddenly the, the environment around you starts to shift. The atmosphere, that black cloud <laughs> that travelled with you everywhere. And you started to enjoy the sunshine of God's love. You started to have a different attitude. And people started to go, what happened to you? Well, was it thunderbolts and lightning? What if it was you read the scripture or were listening to anointed preaching and teaching or listening to the Bible like I do? And the Holy Spirit said, yeah. And he breathed life into a word. And that word, <gasps> it, sometimes it has that cut, right? That if the... Uh, Hebrews, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. 
dividing between soul and spirit joints. So sometimes it's got that surgical, and something drops off and goes, kaboom, and hits the floor. And then you look at it and you go, ooh, ooh, how long has that been traveling with me? Because it was a cyst, it was a cancer, it was a growth, it didn't belong. It wasn't part of your DNA. It's not who God called you to be. It's not part of your new DNA. It's not who you are in Christ. It's the old man, the old self. And it hits the floor. And you go, oh. <laughs> and suddenly you feel a bit lighter. You feel a bit healthier and there's a spark, right? And there's a spring in your step because you, you just left behind some baggage that you didn't need anymore. Hebrews talks about the, the sin that so easily entangles and the weights and the cares that weigh us down. <laughs> so we're waiting for the spectacular when supernaturally you just got set free. Your life will never be the same because the truth entered in. It brought life. It brought hope. It brought vision. You're on a new course. There's a new spark in your step. You're starting to move with a new energy. Your life direction has just changed forever. And it wasn't spectacular. But the glory that God's going to get out of this at the end is spectacular. Whew, I'm having fun already. Now this I say, <laughs> and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of relying on their own understanding. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated. Say that word with me, alienated. What does that mean? Okay, other, the other translations say cut off from, alienated. Yeah, so there's this distance. You ever had that with a family member, an old friend or something, where there's this alienation and you're cut off now and it doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel good. It, it's, there's a certain stress and pain with, and every time you think about it, oh, that person, there's that, oh, they're grieving. There's a grieving that goes with this alienation. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from what? The life of God. Remember, we're talking about on the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. So what is death in this context? Well, if God's life, the source of life, it's like, remember we said earlier, if we shut all these windows and doors, even today in the middle of the sunshine, we can still black out the windows and turn this into, into a hall, into a space where you could not see your hand in front of you. We could do that. And in order to do that, all we'd have to do is actually carefully block out all light from coming in. Right? So they're darkened in their understanding because they're alienated from the life of God, the light. If we're cut off from the love of God, we feel unloved. If we're cut off from the light of God, we stumble in the darkness. It's not rocket science, right? alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. All right. We're talking about what did God mean when God said, on the day you eat this stuff, you'll surely die. Number one, alienation, segregation, to be severed. Where? In relationship. Did God abandon them? No, he turned up. Adam, where are you? You remember the story? And then he had a dialogue with them. What? Why did you hide? Well, I found out I was naked and I felt ashamed and so I, I ran and hid. Did you eat from the tree? It's a dialogue. It's not rejection. There was no flood. The flood came later as a consequence of the whole world being so filled with evil that God was grieved in his heart that he'd even set the process in motion. He was literally grieved in his heart. God can't be taken by surprise. There's nothing you or I can do, say, or experience that can take God by surprise. All right, I will continue the next verse. Oh, I've got to go back to that one. Sorry. I've got trigger happy. I'll do it this way. We're still talking about what does this death thing mean? 
All right, we're still in Ephesians now. So still Apostle Paul, still the letter to the Ephesians, and we're picking it up at the, uh, chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ. Here's that word alienated again, right? Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. And what was the result? No hope. And without God in the world. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Remove God from any person's sphere of life. One of the first things to go is hope. Hope for the future. Why? Because I'm left to my futile mind. I'm left to myself and I already know myself ain't enough. I already know what a mess I've made so far when I'm left on my own. It's not good for man to be alone, Jesus, the Father said. We need one another. The body of Christ is a re real spiritual organism. We need one another. We're not to forsake the fellowshipping together of the saints. We're to provoke one another to good works, spur one another on. Two are better than one. If one falls in a ditch, the other one can pick them up. But if you fall in a ditch when you're on your own, it takes a lot longer to get up. And you have to go through the agony of the fact that there was no one there. And you had to dig your way out. Been there, done that, right? As we all have. So, absence of abs so cut off from the life, separated from the life of Christ. This, these are the things I want you to take note of. Separated from the life of Christ. We're talking about spiritual death now. What is? See, physical death is only the end result, the final consequence of something that happens spiritually. It's the same with healing. You receive healing as a spiritual gift. It's called gifts of healings. So you receive a spiritual gift by the Holy Spirit, boom, in your spirit, and your body responds and reacts, and you come into health and wholeness and healing. And in fact, if you're sick and you take the Word of God and you begin to confess it and you begin to use your, the force of faith in your spirit, you can push that sucker out. I'm telling you, you can. You can drive it. I don't care what its name is. It could be cancer. It could be whatever it is. It doesn't matter. You can take hold of the Word of life, put it in your mouth, feed your spirit, and you can... You can drive that thing out, even if you're doing it one cell at a time. You can force that thing out of you by the force of faith in God and His Word. You can do it. In fact, you need to start exercising that muscle right now. Don't wait. Separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth, the, the um, government of God, strangers to the promises and the covenants of God. So that's all like strange. No hope without God. All right, let's go to this now. Now, look at what Jesus said now. John 15, and this is the night that he was betrayed and he's teaching, he's teaching his disciples and he's pouring into them. John 15, John 16, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's pouring into them and he prays that amazing prayer to the Father in John 17 and then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? The great drops of blood. Look what Jesus said. Didn't we just see it separated from Christ? Remember that previous verse we just read? Separated from Christ? Watch this. Jesus said, I am, what? The vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do? Say it again. From apart from me, you can do? For apart from me, you can do nothing. So why are you busting your gut trying to be God? <laughs> right? Why, why are you creating so much stress for yourself when sometimes what, all you really need to do, let it go. Lay your lame self on the altar. I ain't all that God, but you sure. I need you like water, like wind, like rain. I need you, right? Why 
why have we been trained by this dumb system to be so independent, so self-reliant, so prideful that we can't even humble ourselves before the hand of Almighty God that He can exalt us in due time? Sounds like a scripture because it's James 4.8. Mm-hmm. So why do we have to be... No. Why not, why not learn what the Apostle Paul learnt as a senior man after heaps of trials and shipwrecks and... He went through and beatings and being stoned so that they thought he was dead and dragged him outside the city and just left his corpse there. But it turns out he didn't die. But they thought he was dead. And he says, I figured it out. That when I'm weak, then he gets to be strong. And so I glory in my weakness. I'm not afraid of it anymore. I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I don't have to be the tough guy. I don't have to be the smart guy. I don't have to be the... I'm allowed to be a kid. I'm allowed to go run to my dad and say, Dad, can you help me? The number of times I've cried out to the Lord over these recent weeks with all the dramas of my car and stuff, I stood on a ladder What are we today? Sunday, last week. I was trying to give you, this is really fresh. I'm standing on a ladder. We'd hit another hurdle with my car. It was nothing to do with the gearbox. It was the alternator. They couldn't test the gearbox because the alternator wasn't producing enough voltage. They wanted to charge me nearly $700 for the part. They had to get it in, plus labor. And this thing is just, snowballing and I'm going (laughs) lost for words I was just lost for words I was hit after hit after hit seriously it was amazing (laughs) so uh, I'm standing on a ladder I can picture myself I can tell you where I was I'm standing on a ladder, and I said, <laughs> I said God, <laughs> I really need your help right now. I've got nowhere to go. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm stranded. I'm 400 k's from home, right? I'm stranded. This thing's dragged on for five weeks. I go, God, I've got nowhere to go. I just, I, I'm, I'm at the end. I, I've done everything that I know to do. I've been really patient, I, like, you know, in my thinking, I'm saying, I just, my prayer was actually really simple. It was really quite simple. Yeah. <laughs> because, God, please, I need you to help me, because if you don't intervene, I've got nothing. I, I've got nothing. I've got nowhere to go. I just, please, I need you to be God from you right now. It was, it was like that, pretty much like that, all right? Is that illegal? <gasps> you know, I should have been the man of faith and power, you know? But I didn't. I stood on the ladder and I bared my heart to my father and I said, Lord, I really need your help right now. I really need your help. I don't know what, I don't know what more I can do. And I'm not making this up. I wouldn't make it up. I wouldn't dare to do it. It was less than five minutes and I get a phone call. We got you going. And my brain's going. Because we just had this massive hurdle. I just had a, and I had bad, in like a really bad news phone call only hours before. Another delay, another big expense. I'm going, so my head's going, what? <laughs> did I hear you right? What did you say? He said, yeah, well, it turns out. So my gearbox had failed and my alternator had failed at roughly, pretty much at the same time. So when they put the brand new gearbox in, they couldn't test it because the voltage was wrong. And none of, the te- none of the test equipment was going to work correctly because the alternator wasn't doing its job. So another big expense, one which I was trying to put off and, and do myself a lot cheaper. I'm talking about a tenth of the price. But I'm stuck. I don't even have my car. I even said to the guy, got to one point where I said to the guy, I think I'm ready to put this on a trailer and take it home. So stick with me now. I wasn't planning to go here, but now I'm, I'm too far in there to not to back out. Come back next week. And we'll, no. Uh, <clears throat> tune in next week. No. Um, 
So I got this bad news. Oh, we, well, you want the good news or the bad news? No, just give me both. Right, you know. Well, the gearbox is in. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, says my old mate. Sorry to tell you, we can't, we can't do anything. Yeah, alternator stuffed, and I'm not, I'm not driving this thing out of the driveway with the unless the voltages are right. So unless the voltages are between 13.1 and 13.7 volts, there's no way I'm driving this thing out of the driveway because I'm not going to be responsible for stuffing. I think, you know, it's almost like a replay, right? This is what it sounded like. For stuffing up a brand new gearbox. All right, that was the bad news. I said, okay, leave it with me. Leave it with me, meaning, oh, I've got, I've got, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay, leave it with me. I'm working away. My heart's going, this is not right. It's not supposed to be like this. See, my heart says, my heart says that Jesus said in Matthew 6, 18, your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask. Mm. So my heart says, this picture's not right. It's not supposed to be playing out like this. My head doesn't know what's going on. All right. God bless you. Good to see you, mate. My, my, head's, my head is going... And my heart is just going, okay, God. Wait. So, I'm sorry, I've dragged this story out longer than I needed to. I'm on the ladder. I've told you the ladder. And from my heart, I just call out God. I say, I, I need you to be God right now. Because I've I got nothing. Okay, I've got nothing. Five minutes later, could be anywhere from four to seven minutes. It's, it's literally that little window from me praying that prayer. It was, it was bang, bang. Bang, bang. Got good news for you. And then I'm sort of there almost in disbelief. Like, how's that even possible? Like, how is that possible? You don't know yet because I haven't told you the rest of the story. Come back next week. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm on this ladder. Recognise the number. Recognise the voice. Waiting for another hit, you know. Like, what's going on? Well, I've got good news for you. We got, we got you. We got you sorted. What? <laughs> so here's the story. You, you, ready to, you ready to smile, crack a big smile with me? Okay. This is just amazing. All of my car problems started with a, a rattling noise on, on my alternator. My car's sitting there dead. Can't go anywhere. A local guy with the same model. Are you ready for this? Right, strap in for this one. <laughs> a guy with the same model car comes in with a rattly noise on his alternator. So they order him a brand new alternator and take his out of his car. And it suddenly dawned on them that they could put his alternator, which is giving the correct voltage, it's just noisy, and they could put his alternator in my car and get me going. And they did all, they just went ahead and did it. And this guy's turned up with, and so when I go to pick up my car, there's a silver car, the exact same model, sitting next to mine. Because God arranged it <laughs> so that that guy's alternator that got took out or, and a new one coming could transfer into mine so that I could leave. Wow. Aren't you lucky? No, I'm not lucky. Are you kidding me? The same model. So I drove away with an alternator, and you know want to know what is just like it's just icing on top of God's wonderful cake is that the end cost was lower than what he quoted me before I even started the job because he got the gearbox oil at a discount. So the, the final bill was $100 less, and I ended up with a second hand, a used alternator transferred into my car, and I'm here today because why? Because I'm special. <laughs> no. No. Because I have a God who is my Father. And I realise I've come to the point of discovery that when I'm weak, He's strong. And He gets to show out. And He gets to show out. And He loves it. He really loves it. He just... He wanted a family. He 
planned you. He wanted a family. He wanted to be surrounded by kids. And you that kid. And there's nothing you could possibly imagine or need that he will say no to. Unless it was harmful to you, just like any parent. I am the vine, says the Lord Jesus in John 15, verse 5. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do. And it's all right to say it. It's all right to say it. It's all right. If anyone does not abide in me, what happens? Come on, people. He is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. Sounds like at the end of the age, the reapers come, the wheat is separated from the tares, the sheep from the goats, there's a fire. So alienation from the life of God means you wither up and die. Now, for if you chop a branch off a tree, there'll be a number of days, three, five days maybe, that depending on how big the branch is, those leaves are going to start to stay green a little while and it's going to start to brown off a little bit, shrivel a little bit. So it's not obvious straight away. When we get separated from God, it's not obvious straight away. You know when that relationship sort of, we, when we sort of drift a little bit? Oh, it's not obvious straight away. But it becomes obvious. Not too far down the track. And that's why Jesus said you need to abide, remain. So it's the word is either remain or abide. Abide, remain, stay connected. Because at the end of the day, and the beginning of the day, and all through the day, he divine, I the branch. He the life giver, I the life receiver. Now fruit is being produced in my life for God's glory, which is what Jesus said. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. John 15, 8. It's not in the notes, but that's it. John 15, 8. This is to my Father's glory, to his glory, that you bear fruit, which proves that you're my disciples, that you're following with me, that you're connected to me. So my job is abide, 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 cling, cling, hold, abide, abide, suck, drink, drink from the water of life, read the word, feed on the word, stay in fellowship, stay in communion. And if I do that, then his fruit starts to be produced in my life. And he makes me look good, but it's not me. (laughs) <laughs> when I say it makes you look good, I'm not talking about pride. I'm just simply saying, simply saying that whatever good you see, I can really quite confidently say with James, James 1, 17, is it that every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. He divine, I, de bre- I a branch, you a branch, you a branch, you a branch. We branches together. In the same vine. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And one one when when pardon? Glory to him. Glory to him. And when one hurts, we all hurt. We feel it. You may not even know it, you may not even believe it, you may not even perceive it, but when one hurts, we all hurt. We are connected. We are one in him. All right, that's my introduction. which sets the scene for the part after the introduction. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. Amplified Classic does a great job of this, as it does with many verses. Great, it's a great translation. Therefore, if any person, did you say any? Did any per, if any person is engrafted, there's that beautiful word, right? In Christ, he divine with a branch. Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, He, she, they are a new creation, a new creature all together. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. Isn't that beautiful? That's powerful. And what happens is our hearts register with that. Like right now, your heart just leapt. Your spirit leapt at that truth because it is the truth. And your mind may well have gone, yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, like, everything's passed away, like everything. 
Well, no, some of our thinking's not renewed. And in the areas where our thinking's not renewed, some of our behaviours, choices, decisions, actions are not renewed. And each one of them produces consequences, so some of the consequences of those things haven't gone away yet. But they can. If we renew our thinking, change our attitudes, behaviours and actions, you reap what you... what goes around... No, it's not a Bible verse, but you get the idea. <laughs> it's a saying that reinforces you read what you say. What goes around comes around. All right. So here's, here's what that word creation actually means. If anyone is engrafted in Christ, he is a new creation. You ready for this? Because this is really cool. The word creation is that one. Have fun pronouncing that. And here's what it means. Using helps word studies, which is an excellent resource, Create, it, it means creation, creature. So if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. And the, and the Amplified brought that out. Which is founded from <laughs> nothing. Okay, so, and God said, Genesis chapter 1, and God said, and there was so there's no material universe. There's no sun, stars, moon, fish, cr critters, creatures, stuff. Nothing. No material. So when you and I manufacture or create something, we take existing material and build, manufacture, shape, model, fashion, right? From existing. So it's hard for our minds to capture this necessarily straight up. But the principle is from nothing. Because God can do that. He can go... And from nothing, no material substance, create what didn't exist before. And if any man is in Christ, God has gone into a situation where there's an emptiness and a void and gone, and created what did not previously exist. He didn't remodel you. He didn't put on a band-aid. You didn't have surgery. You haven't gone to anger management. To manage yourself, you got born again. Something from nothing. I was nothing. <laughs> when he found me, I was nothing. And I ain't claiming to be anything right now. I'm a branch. He divine. And he's doing a great job of being a vine. And I'm hanging on to him like there's no tomorrow. Because me and him connected for. He who unites himself with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He who unites himself with the Lord is one spirit. So I am already connected to the vine. I need to abide. That's it. So that's the day. You know, whoever would come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. So the abiding is a daily choice part. But in the spirit, I am connected. You are connected. Even if you take a day off, take a powder. Huh? Take a week off. Take a month off. Backslide. I'm not recommending any of those. I'm just saying he is faithful. The scripture says, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. Okay. Creation, which is found from nothing. Creation out of nothing. And the Latin, I love it, is ex nihilo. You may have heard that before. Ex out of nihilo. Nada, nothing. Okay. So if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature that has commenced in that moment. This is why this is so powerful. This is why we're going to dwell just a moment longer because this is sinking in even as we're talking about it. Anyone who is in Christ, at the moment that you were born again, you're not a reformed person. God has initiated a new creature. Just the mirror doesn't tell you that. Your friends and family won't necessarily tell you that. They'll see some immediate changes. You'll feel and sense, you're, you're looking out the windows of your world and the, your world has changed instantly in that moment. But the mind, of course, we talked about the mind being renewed and the flesh, it still wants to do the fleshy, fleshy bits, right? Okay. But if anyone is in Christ, there's a brand new beginning and it's not rhetoric, it's not philosophy, it's the new birth. It's the spirit of life breathing 
And the man form, and God formed man out of the dust of the earth and breathed into him the, the breath of life, the spirit of life. So the word breath, wind, spirit in both New Testament Greek and Old Testament Hebrew are completely one word, interchangeable. And God breathed into the man the spirit of life, the breath of life, and he became a living being. And what was material became eternal. He was never meant to die. All right, I'll keep moving. All right, this is awesome. Hebrew, uh, Ephesians, I should say, 2.10. Amplified Classic again. Does an amazing job of this. Here we go. For we are God's own handiwork. God is a hands-on God. His workmanship recreated. I love the way the, the Amplified Classic does this. Recreated in Christ Jesus. Born anew that we may do those good works which God predestined planned beforehand for us. Taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Let's have a look at this in the Passion Translation. does a great job of this as well. Just to give it another slightly different uh, flavour. We have become his poetry. So that word workmanship, is, it's poema. In, in the Greek, P-O-E-M-A, a creative expression. So we could say, we are God's poetry, we are God's creative expression. God, sorry, I'm rushing and I shouldn't. God has creatively expressed himself in you. You are a creative expression of the heartbeat of God. That's why you're absolutely unique. Your fingerprints are unique. Did you know that even identical twins do not have the same fingerprint? Mm -hmm. Biology says they're identical. Sociology says, well, we're the, we are the result of our environment. Are identical twins the same? Unique individuals, like radically unique. One could be a leader, one could be shy, quiet. One could be creative and arty, and the other one could be analytical. And one could be musical, and the other one couldn't sing a note to save their life. And they have the same biology, same voice box. What's going on there, people? Well, your you didn't come from mummy and daddy. That's what Jesus said. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. You're not defined by what you see in the mirror. Mummy and daddy don't define you. Even your upbringing, oh look, they shaped you. Maybe they even wounded you. Maybe there's some bruises and some, yes, I understand that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, um, well, actually, even in the midst of that, it still doesn't define your you because your you is God breathed. Those two precious little kids growing up and mum and dad dressing them the same for a while and initially people can't tell. After a while, anybody who gets to know the family or any of the school kids know immediately by behaviours which and character which one's which and quirks and you know facial expressions and stuff and they start to express the them on that inside okay finishing the verse we have become his poetry a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us this is awesome for we are joined to jesus right the vine and the branch the anointed one even before we were born god planned in advance our destiny and the good works we sh we would do to fulfill it that is so awesome. I'm going to read it again. I love it. I feel like I'm having a deep drink. We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus. All right. So that death thing is no longer, it's gone. It's, it's resolved. We are joined to Jesus, the anointed one, even before we were born. God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Oh, 
Woo! I'm glad I came. I would have traveled all the way from Muddy for this. All right, so this is not a Bible verse. This is me summarizing. We have been born anew in Christ Jesus to bring us back into alignment with God the Father's original purpose, design, and intention for our lives. God never loses sight of his vision. God's vision for you never got blurred. He never lost hope. He never lost hope. He never lost hope. He says in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, my word never returns to me void, but always fully accomplishes everything I send it to do, just like the rain will never return and come back and form clouds again until it's watered the earth and, and caused seed to sprout and provided uh, bread to eat and seed for the sower and bread for food, right? If it, uh, Isaiah 55, 10 and 11. And that's the way God's attitude is. It's not changing for you or I, but if he says it, that's what I mean. That's his intent. And he's 100% focused. The, right? I'll just stick with that. You get, you're getting that. I, I believe it's sinking into your heart. He's not a quitter. He's not like us. You know, we, we make promises. I made a promise to a young fella, uh, one of my young students, that I couldn't follow through with. But at the time, I made, because I got stuck with a broken down car. But at the time I made the promise, I fully intended to do it. I didn't lie to him but I wasn't able to follow through with it. God doesn't have that problem. Right? He doesn't have those limitations. <coughs> Ephesians, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 1, 3 to 5. Back into ESV. <coughs> excuse me a minute. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him, Come on, we've done this verse so many times and I'm happy to revisit it every week if we had to. Even as he, God the Father, chose us in him, Christ Jesus. When? Before. Before what? The foundation of the what? <laughs> okay. So did the fall of Adam and Eve and their major stuff up Happened before or after you were planned? It happened after. It happened after. It's a disruption. It's a hiccup. It's an obstruction. It's a, it's a glitch. But you were planned before the mess ever happened. You were planned before the mistake. You were planned before the fall. You were planned before darkness entered into this world. Your origin is ancient. Have you ever thought of it that way? Everything that you look at around you started with a thought. I'll give you, I'll give you a real quick example. I won't do a long story, I promise. Not really, I promise. <laughs> ever seen a nice Porsche? I like the 911s. Porsche Carrera 911. Oh, sorry, Carrera, they're two different things. So the Porsche Carrera. Black, of course. Black. All right, but pick your favouritest this dream car, right? Your favourite is this, this dream car right now. You're driving one. You bought a, just bought a new car. Okay. All right. Do you know that if we were to go back to, say, Egypt four and a half thousand years ago, what if we went back a little bit before that? Let's go back 5,000 years. So about 500 years before Egypt and the, the pyramids and stuff. Do you know that every single element of that car already existed and all it took was accumulated knowledge to be able to get to the point where that stuff could be mined out of the ground smelted refined paint could be developed electrical electric everything already existed on the planet for thousands of years that porsche everything everything that was necessary they could have built the porsche six thousand years ago Am I right? Okay, so this is what I want you to understand is you are ancient in the sense of in the heart of God, God thought first. So, so the Porsche 
came into existence because somebody eventually dreamed it and thought it and then went found and dug the stuff out of the ground and it really is dirt. Like even our bodies are like, what is it, 70% water and the rest is, you know, a bucket of dirt sort of thing. Yeah. And that's what it returns to at the end. Okay. The, the dehydrates, the water goes and ashes to ashes, dust to dust. All right. Everything starts with a thought. Everything you can see started with a thought, a designer, an image. Same with you, same with me. <clears throat> Only thing is, it was before the foundation of the world, before there was dust, before God breathed into the dust that he formed out of mouth. Before any of that, he chose us. And this is the point. The point is, you're not a mistake. It's not possible for you to be a mistake because God breathed you into your mother's womb. And even if your, pre your pregnancy, your birth wasn't a planned pregnancy, that's the mum and dad thing. They don't define you. They don't define me. Yes, their influence has marked us to this day, but they don't define us, whether they planned or didn't plan. If you're a test tube baby, it still doesn't change the fact that you are alive because God breathed spirit life into that um, conception. Okay, let's keep going, Dean. All right. Just to finish this particular thought, still in Ephesians, what a, what a book of wonderful revelation that he got downloaded from Jesus Christ. Now, this is the New Living Translation does of the same verses, and it does a, just a great job. I love this particular translation. Are you ready for it? Say yes. Okay. <laughs> Let me know you're still with me. Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. Even before he made the world... So it's the same verse as New Living Translation. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself. How? Through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted to do. And what happened? And it gave him... So the thought of you... In God's heart, put a smile on his dial. <laughs> it does. I'm seeing your face today has put a smile on mine. <laughs> Capture this. Let it drop into your heart. The thought of you, before, even before the world was founded, the thought of you made God smile. Just like the thought of your grandkid coming to visit or something that they did last time they visited puts this kind of <laughs> silly, goofy look on your face. God had a goofy look about you on his face. When he thought of you, it made him smile. He just made him smile because he could see. He could see your uniqueness. He could see your quirkiness. He could see himself in you. Oh, boy. All right. How's everybody doing? All right. Hand up everybody who's giving me another 10 minutes. Will you give me another 10? Yeah, so it's 10, 20, 30, 40. <laughs> okay. <So. clears throat> well, that was legit, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I saw you was only halfway up. He must have known what was coming. Yeah, he's been here before. Romans 8, <laughs> 29, 30. That's an old one. Mario Murillo. That's, mate, cracks me up. I borrowed it. For those, uh, Romans 8, 29, 30, for those he foreknew, God, he also predestined. Can, can you, you know, foreknowledge, predestination. Are you seeing a theme happening here? Like God knows stuff that you don't know. <laughs> you know he sees things that you don't see. He saw the generations before you. He's seen the generations after you. He knows the generations that you're currently influencing and what they will do. And you are yet to influence lives. Remember, every life is eternal. Even though our bodies pass away, every life is an eternal person. You are yet to influence lives that don't exist yet. They have not yet been born. And before you draw your last breath or take or caught up, if it turns out that way, there are children, eternal persons, not yet born, that you are destined to influence. Right now, I have the privilege of influencing seven, eight, nine, ten-year-olds 
and I never knew it. There's no chance I could have imagined it was ever going to happen. I never knew our lives were going to intersect. And it's a great joy and a wonderful privilege. And now it makes me go, oh, wow. Oh, wow, what's yet to come? What are these kids going to become? Who are they going to influence? What? Right? Snowball, mushroom effect, right? Amazing. I didn't see it coming. I'm sure, I'm sure glad. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. So there's some work to be done. Right? You get the idea that there's a, there's a work in progress. In order that he might be the firstborn, Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers, brethren, family. I love the um, P and G, use the, they say family, like it's F-E-M-I-L-I -I kind of thing. Family. And it's beautiful the way they say it. And they think family. Because they have very little, they think community. They think family. They still watch out for one another. They still watch out for the neighbours. They still watch out. Like we used to have, you know, years and years ago, um, everybody in the street sort of watched out for one another. The street was a community. You know what I mean? That's one of the things I do like about coming out west. It's a little bit, it's a little bit old school. Like That's nice. And those he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. So that's dealing with the sin issue. Right, the righteousness, cleaning up the, the, the sin and just removing it out of the way. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So his glory is on the inside of us. And the final glorification, to use that you know, old, sort of old English word, is actually when we leave behind our old bodies. So there's no temptation to sin. So, and that, the Bible teaches that that happens either at the resurrection, if you pass away before the return of Christ, or it's actually done, in, this Thessalonians tells us it's instantaneous. If you hear the final trumpet sound of God and you're still alive on the earth, you're caught up to be with him in the air and transformed in the twinkling of an eye. You can check that out for yourself in Thessalonians. Two Thessalonians, I think, one or two. They're both good, just read, just read. Okay. To all who did receive him, so verse 11 says, he came to his own, but his own did not recognize him and did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, Jesus Christ, who believed in his name, he gave them what? The right, the privilege. So the old English version says power. It's a mistranslation because it's actually the word authority or right. It's the power of privilege. It's the power of authority. Right? It's the power to exercise a right or an authority. So he gave them the authority. He gave them... So, yeah, that's awesome. He gave them the authority... He gave them the right to become children of God. And what the Holy Spirit just, deposit, just lit up to me then was he legitimized. So God created a legitimate uh, authority. So the idea of authority is that it's completely legitimate. It's completely done, dusted, sealed, legitimately brought us into his family as kids, his kids, children of God. Romans 8.15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the capital, the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba is the Aramaic, so daddy, papa, father. Dad, daddy. You know, remember, the, when, the, remember when the dad would get home, at, you know, in the afternoon, and the toddlers are still home. They've been home with mum. She's a homemaker. And they hear the car in the driveway. What's their reaction? Daddy. And they run to the door. Okay. Okay, next two verses. The Spirit himself bears witness. The Holy Spirit, capital S. Bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How do we know it? Well, the mirror's not going to tell you. But the Holy Spirit does. He affirms it. He's been doing it while we've been speaking. Through his word, he's been reaffirming you. He's been validating you. He's been, he's been uh, affirming to you your identity as a new creature in Christ. And that's what we needed today. And if we are children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. And Galatians 4, 6 and 7, And because you are sons, 
God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave. It's no longer about, like Jesus said, it's not about being a slave to a system, a slave to a religion, a slave to a Sabbath, a slave to thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And if somehow you manage to make it through a day without breaking several of them, somehow might God might go, hmm, I guess that's better than yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's this stinking religious systems have polluted God to us. They've misrepresented God to us. They have, ta- they have tarred and feathered God. It's corrupt. But you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Come on. Now we're going to quickly talk about name changes. It's happened multiple times and there's a very good reason we're going to do this. So I'm going to hit it real quick because it's pretty straightforward before we crack open our final nugget and wrap up eventually. I mean, wrap up soon. Um, Genesis 17, 5 and 6. God speaking directly to Abram. Notice A-B-R-A-M, because that was his original name. No longer shall your name be called Abram. Your name shall be called Abraham. Or if we were to pronounce it, it probably be Abraham or something like that, right? But, you know, we know it as Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come out of, from you. And his wife's barren. And he's old. And it looks like there's no chance. I mean, that sounds really, really nice. And if you'd have turned up like 25 years ago and my wife didn't have this kind of health issue thing going on, well, you know, maybe. uh, And God says, nope. Nope. I already know your future. I already see your future. And guess what? The name your parents gave you isn't your identity. Here's your identity. So Abram, A-B-R-A-M, means exalted father. Abraham means father of a multitude. And God takes away his past and presents him with, this is who I always saw you to be. This is what I always planned for you. And Abraham's head's spinning. But he goes, okay, well, you God, you know. Oh, that sounds good to me. Oh, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in, I'm in. If you can make it happen, I'm in, you know. <laughs> Ah, isn't that amazing? Because God doesn't speak about where you was. He speaks about who you are in his eyes, in his sight, in his heart, what he breathed you to become. And so when he steps into a situation, he ain't talking about what mum and dad's opinion was. He ain't talking about who you've been labelled. He ain't talking about what were the scars of the past. He's talking about what I made you to be, why I sent you into the earth. You're actually here on assignment. Oh, I thought I was an accident of, you know. No, assignment. Yeah, I know, I can hear those cogs turning. But it's true, we're here on assignment. You'll see that as we go. Here's another time, here's another time. So, so the grandson of Abram now. And I, we could do more, we could do Sarah, we, could, you know, we could get into more. We're just picking the highlights. So we're at Genesis 35, 10 and 11. And God says to Abram, he's talking to him, oh, sorry, to, to uh, Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, he says to him, your name is Jacob. And you might remember that the word Jacob means supplanter. S-U-P-P-L-A-N-T-E-R. A supplanter is someone who tries to take over a position, but they either use trickery or force to do it. Sounds a little bit like Russia and Ukraine, you know, that kind of thing. Right, where there's no legitimate war, there's no reason for you to be there, but you feel that you have a right, so you're going to force yourself into the situation. All right, and it also means, so that's it's, that's, it means he grasps the heel, because you might remember that as um, his older brother Esau was coming out, being born, and there's this little hand coming out, right, and it's, it's uh, Jacob grasping the heel. And so it's figurative and literal. It's interesting, the word. He grasps the heel, so he's clutching, 
right? Come back, I want to be first out, you know, because first out gets all the privilege. All right, so it's that kind of thing. And he was labeled that by his parents because of the birth scenario. And God says, no, that don't fit. No, that don't fit you. No, that doesn't fit you. I don't care how long they called you that. I don't care. I don't care what they saw or what they thought or what they've labeled you as. I don't see you like that at all. No, I don't care about their opinion. Yeah, I know the way life's treated you. I understand what you've been through. I've, I've watched the whole thing. But you need to understand that that ain't you. This is who you are. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. Sounds like what he told his grandfather, right? So it's being passed forward now. So God was dealing with Abraham about generations that were yet to be born. And meanwhile, Abraham's going, yeah, but I don't have a kid and my, el- my, my servant's going to end up being the heir of my thing. And he's just looking at all the stuff. He's just looking at the moment. He's just trying to process the moment. And God's speaking generationally about who you're going to be and what's going to come out of your walk of faith and obedience. Your walk of faith and obedience is going to create this kind of influence into the world. What? <laughs> you sure about that? <laughs> you sure you got the right address? You know, like. <laughs> and so Israel means, uh, it's, it's kind of a little bit ambiguous, but it means strives with God or God strives. Or um, the word strive can mean persevere perseveres with God or God perseveres so the idea of striving is not just a lot of contention it's actually about hanging in there and overcoming so uh, whichever way you look at it this new name had had within it God um, Israel so El Elohim so e, the El part is the God part and then Israel is the um, the, the persevering, the sort of hanging in the... Because remember, uh, the, the back story is he wouldn't let go of the angel. Remember, he saw angels ascending and descending. And he goes, wow, this is Bethel. I didn't even know this was God's house. And in a dream, he saw this thing. And then the, he finally grabs a hold of this angel and says, you ain't leaving here till you bless me because I can tell you're from, you're from God's place, right? And he's hanging on and, and, and they wrestle till morning. Remember that? And then the angels... That have this dialogue. So anyway, the point I'm focusing on now is the name change. What you've always been identified by until now is inaccurate. It's incomplete. In fact, it's quite ignorant because they don't know who I made you to be. They don't know nothing about my purpose for you. So here's who I say you is. Let's walk it out together. And this is amazing. So in Nehemiah, he gives this commentary. Nehemiah 9, 7, he says, You are the Lord, the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. Chaldeans were sorcerers, diviners. They got into witchcraft. They were into occult. Ur is thought to be somewhere in um, Turkey, that sort of region there. Uh, It's said that they were like moon worshippers. So Chaldeans would follow the stars. You know how we have the wise men? Well, that's the old English. It's magi, M-A-G-G-I is the real word. And and, uh, they followed a star because they were astrologers. Right? They were, so they were, they were the modern generation in Jesus' time of Chaldeans, people who looked at the stars and tried to figure out the future based on the stars, astrology. So God calls a guy out of a place where they're into witchcraft and idolatry, astrology, moon worship and the stars. And he calls him out of there and he says, that was never who you were. <laughs> you always been in my heart the father of many nations. 
You've never been. See? Isn't it? Can you see that? Like, God calls him out of because God never saw him as a, as a, as a devil worshipper. God always saw him as a friend of God, one who talked to God face to face. And that friendship developed because Abraham listened and responded and obeyed. And he could then step into the destiny that God had always had for him. All right. And just to wrap this up now. Don't snicker. That's not funny. All right. <laughs> John chapter 1. I think, it's, I think if you will pervert, persevere with me another little bit longer, I, I believe you will uh, benefit from this little round off at the end here. They're sitting at the, um, they're sitting at the Passover feast the night Jesus was betrayed. So they're about to leave that feast, go to the garden. The soldiers will come to the garden with the priest and stuff like that. And No, the priests, they were cowards. They stayed behind. They sent Anyway, you know, you know the story. So the arrest is about to happen. This is the, the Last Supper. You know, we know it as the Last Supper. <laughs> and in the middle of it, they're wrangling about who's the greatest. <laughs> you know, like these guys. They're wrangling about who's the greatest. Um, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. John said, thinks, well, I'm the favourite. If I ask Jesus, he'll tell me. You know, we, all this stuff's going on. It's quite an, quite an amazing time. So here's, this, we're at the table. You're with me now? We're at the table. Oh, sorry. No, before we get to the table, we're talk, still talking name changes. Ready? Sorry about this. Name change. John chapter 1, verses 40 to 42. One of the two who heard John speak, John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. One of those who heard John the Baptist speak, and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon. So that was the, uh, that's our English version of Simeon, right? You are Simon, the son of John. Not John the Baptist and not John the disciple. It just was a popular name. You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is the Aramaic, the language of the day. And then, of course, for our benefit, it says, which means Peter, Petra, Petros, I'm sorry, Petros. Okay, what does it all mean? I'm glad you asked. Simon was used in the Bible. There's seven different people called Simon. So it was a reasonably common name. Do you know what its meaning is? No, neither do I, because it didn't have one. It was one of the very few names that had no particular meaning. No definition. You can research it, study it, and it's like, it's just a name. Which is really interesting, because in their culture and in their language, the name usually, very commonly represented a specific attribute or, or something, right? It had a definition or a meaning about it, like Jacob, the heel, sort of thing, right? So Simon's kind of this no-name guy. No particular, yeah, yeah, Simon, yeah. yeah, he's a good guy, but he's Simon, he's a, yeah, no, no, but nothing, nothing outstanding, nothing, no big expectations from Simon, he's just, oh, that's, yeah, Simon. And Jesus meets him for the very first time, he knows who his dad is, because Jesus, you know, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. You're Simon, the son of John, you are, but you shall be. But I follow this. You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called. You shall be called. There's coming a future time when you shall be called rock. And the word rock there is a standalone rock. Uh, it can be anything from a, you know, uh, a handheld rock right up to a boulder. It's not a monolith like... Um, What's our red center? Ayers Rock, sorry. Yeah, so that's a monolith. That would be a Petra. He's a Petros, right? Peter. So follow with me now. Jesus is just meeting Simon for the first time. 
Nothing outstanding about Simon that we know of. All we know about him is he, fish, he catches fish, along with his brother Andrew and its dad's business. We also find out later that he's got a wife. No kids to mention, and that's it. Right? Okay. Now we're at the table. All right, there's a little bit, that's the little backstory. Now we're at the table. Let's do this. Luke 22. Thank you, Father, for Luke. Jesus is talking to all of the disciples now. At this stage, I think Judas is probably gone. Okay, just really listening closely because this is powerful stuff. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials. So there's probably just the 11 in front of him at this stage. And listen to this. And he says, and I assign to you, as my father has assigned to me, a kingdom. And you will eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Would you like Jesus to say something like that to you? Like, whoa, you know, you want a prophecy? You want to line up for a prophecy? Look at that one. I assign to you a kingdom so that you may eat at my table in my kingdom. And not only that, each one of you is going to sit on a throne and you're going to sit as judges over this entire nation. That's what Jesus sees and speaks over these 11 guys. Yeah? Next verses, same breath almost, turns to, turns to Peter. And watch this. Does he call him Peter? No. He says, Simon, Simon. Yeah. Like he said to Martha, Martha. You know. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> it's like what, it feels like one of those moments. Here. I, I might be reading that in, but he says, Simon, Simon, yes, Lord. Behold, Satan has demanded to have you, and that word is plural, have you guys, have you all. Satan has demanded to have you guys that he may sift you guys like wheat. The both words are plural. But I have prayed for you, singular, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, repented, <laughs> strengthen your brothers. Oh, I want you to stay, stay with me. This is really amazing. Peter said to him, and in the original language, it's just he said to him. So that's where there isn't actually the word Peter. It's just, but the translators to help us put Peter in. It's just, he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And we know from the other text that he goes on to say, oh no, these guys might, but I certainly wouldn't. Right? No, he does that. There's so much powerful stuff in here. So he just told them, and I haven't jumped, I haven't jumped from Luke to Matthew or to Mark or anything. Like these are just consecutive verses. He just said, you guys are going to sit with me on the throne. You're going to sit at my table. You're going to rule over. And by the way, Simon, you're about to betray me. And, um, but when you've repented, I need you to strengthen your brothers. <laughs> Am I hearing? What was in that cup of wine, Jesus? You didn't have too many, did you? Like, because, are you sure that's not an alcoholic, Lord? <laughs> because... Is it a contradiction? No. Because Jesus can boldly and confidently speak about your future knowing that your immediate circumstances may not look like your future. <laughs> that you may have one heck of a crash and burn. <laughs> but you're going to make it. Because I see you in your future and your future's with me at my table sitting next to me on my throne and it's gonna be so cool and what comes 
out of this crash and burn moment that you're about to experience, Peter, on the other side of it, you're going to come out stronger and these guys are going to need that strength. So make sure you strengthen them because they're going to go through it too. They're going to go through some stuff that they're not quite ready for as well. Because like, there's some stuff coming their way that they don't know is coming yet. yet. They don't really understand what's about to happen. So they're going to need what I'm, what's about to be deposited in you as you come up and out through this thing. The people around you are going to need that. They're going to draw strength from that. They're going to be able to feed on the life of God that's come through that trial and that test and that fire. And that furnace of fire is producing strength in you that other people need. They need you. So it's not a contradiction because God never loses sight of the big picture. He never loses sight of who you really are. He never loses sight of your real name your real purpose, your real identity. And that's why this message is called your true identity. And here's where we wrap it up. Listen to this, Revelations chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus himself speaking. The resurrected Christ, seated on his throne, speaking. He says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, or we know from other translations, overcomes, to the one who overcomes, to the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna. And what will he do? And I will give him a white stone. And what's it got on it, people? With a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Oh, come on. Who knows your true identity? The one who breathed you into your mother's womb. The one who gave you life. He knows your true identity. And when you see that stone, you're going to hold that so precious. No one else will know except the person. It'll be so precious. It'll be that, it'll be that per personal moment that you own with God and, and no one else knows what's written on that stone. And you're going to hold that for eternity, that you're going to carry that. And you're going to look at that. And you're going to see who he made you to be. And you will worship him forever and you go, Lord, I never knew, I didn't, I couldn't, I never had, I never imagined. And you're going to hold it so close, so close. Psalm 139, 16, Amplified Classic. King David got the revelation. Beautiful, it's a beautiful psalm, read the whole thing, but for today, verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance and in your book, all the days of my life were written before they took shape, when as yet there was none of them. I'm going to read it one more time. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and, all, and in your book all the days of my life were written, recorded, documented. I used the phrase journaled one time. I said, God journaled about you. Before he ever breathed you into your mother's womb, he wrote a journal about you. Before they took shape, when as yet there was none of them. Other translation, you know, before I breathed my first breath, that kind of thinking. And we're going to close it off there. There's more scriptures I can share with you, but I believe we've hit the heart of what God was wanting to encourage you today. What's your current obstacle? And does it really matter? Will it matter 100 years from now? Will it really matter 100 years from now? I'm not minimising the pain. Everyone's got their pain and scars and we're not going down that pathway because there's a future. There's the ability to make decisions today to transform your tomorrow. But what I want you to also grasp is that transforming your tomorrow transforms everybody around you's tomorrow because you are an influence whether you like to admit it, acknowledge it or not. Whether you see it or you don't, you're an influence. Either the storm cloud you're under is an influence or the sunshine that you walk with, comes with you into the room is an influence, but it's still an influence. And we all have our stormy days. I got a good soaking when I was in <laughs> Maji. But God is so great and gracious. And he's bigger than all of those things. 
And your eternal identity is so much more than what you see in the mirror and what your past tells you you are, or the people around you, even your parents. And if your DNA has caused you to have certain limitations, some people are born with limitations. And that could be everything from an actual disability right through to somebody who really wants to play guitar but they've got fingers that are like little tree stumps, you know, and that kind of thing. And I understand. But that doesn't define you either. Your name is known to God. Your name is your identity. He's already given you a new name. He's called you righteous. He's called you son of the most high God. He's put his own spirit inside of you to bear witness, to confirm and validate that that's true. And that's what he's wanted to, to be doing today as we've shared is to continue to reaffirm you and revalid, reaffirm that validation. It's never gone away and it's not going to. But sometimes we need to be reminded and from a position of security, step into tomorrow, today, the rest of today. Step into the challenges that come. They're coming. They're there. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage. I've overcome this world. So it doesn't matter what the tribulation looks like. I'm already up and above and over all that. You know, I said to um, some the PNG friends, when we left Sydney on one of the treks, I'm just closing with this thought. When we left Sydney on one of the treks, <laughs> it's very hot in PNG, right? Like a cool... A, it, it, cool to them would be like 23, you know, 22 maybe. If it dropped to 22 overnight, that's in winter. What is, do they even have winter? But, you know, because it's so close to the equator. So anyway, we get in this aeroplane. It's a rainy, drizzly day in Sydney. It's not crazy cold. It's probably about 18 or something like that. 19 maybe. We get on the plane and all of the lovely PNG people are asking the stewardesses and stuff for the, for the blankets, you know, the throws and they're covering themselves up. And I'm quite comfortable and I'm sort of having a little smile to myself because they're not conditioned, you know. They're, and so they're all rugging up like this, even though the plane's still probably temperature controlled to 22 or 23. And so we get up and you climb up and fairly quickly you climb and you pop up and you're out of the clouds. And I was able to share with him when I, that Sunday when I got there, that little story and just the old saying, you know, the sun is always shining on the other side of the clouds. Mm -hmm. It's always shining. And so what does that mean today? It means the sunshine of God's love, his favour, God is light, God is love. The sunshine of his light and favour is not subject to the clouds that might pass between and cause you to feel like, he loves me not, you know. Mm -hmm. The sun is always shining on the other side of the clouds. So Father, we're just so grateful <clears throat> that you've chosen us before the foundation of the world, that you've adopted us as your own children. Lord Jesus, sir, you made it possible an enormous personal sacrifice. And words are not enough to say thank you for all that you've done and are continuing to do. You're the pioneer of our salvation. You're the author and the perfecter of our faith. You're the beginning and the end. You're the Alpha and Omega. You're the Son of the Most High God. And we give you praise, Majesty, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. We worship you, King of Glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Father, we give you all the honour and praise. Thank you for sending Christ Jesus, your only Son, your heartbeat into the world to redeem, rescue and ransom our lives and bring us into your holy family. In Jesus' name, and if you're listening or watching today and you don't know, you haven't had that experience of coming into God's family, it's, that's a new language to you, but you sure want it, let's pray together. All I'm going to do is pray a really simple prayer. I'm going to say a line. You can repeat that line. You're not a parrot. It's not about that. It's about just in your own heart, in your own words, put your heart into these words. If you want to come into God's family, Jesus has done all that's required to make the way open for you and I to come into God's family. God started the whole process. He sent Jesus to make it possible. We found that out today. 
And he's inviting you right now to come through the gateway, which is Jesus, into the family. If you want to do that, I'm asking you to pray with me now this really simple prayer in Jesus' name. Ready? Let's do it together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. I really want to be born again, made brand new on the inside so that I can live the life you always planned for me. I want to come into your family and I ask you to forgive me for all of my failures, my sins and my selfishness. Cleanse me, Father. Make me clean. Make me new from the inside out. By your Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. And I believe it, Father, and I receive it through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, we'd love to hear from you. Drop us a line on Facebook. Come and visit us here at Church, 8 Golden Street, West Wylong, just behind Armstrong Toyota and Sports Spot. We'd love to fellowship with you. If you aren't able to be here physically, connect with us again the next time around. We're on YouTube. You can su subscribe to that to keep up to date with the videos there. <clears throat> and also, of course, Facebook. Uh, happy to hear from you, love to hear from you. And if we ever get the opportunity to see you in person, if you're able to visit, please do that. All right. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your week. We love you. Have a great day.